My name is Michael, Michael Sims, and I have not lived a normal life. Well, not a normal human life, anyway. Perhaps not even a standard existence for one of my kind. It seems my motivation is far less grand than that of many of my peers. I guess I'm also far less interested in my origin, and even less interested in interfering with the human governments and industry on this planet we share. My interests have been of a personal nature. Although I'm often accused of being selfish, it is my choice to use my gifts as I see fit, and it will remain this way. You may be wondering what I mean by one of my kind. My tribe, as the saying goes. Well, my kind are not just choosing a union as a result of mutual interests, faith, nationality, or philosophy. We are tied by some kind of freakish genetic superfunction, a blessed anomaly that seems to have nothing to do with the gene pool of our parents, nor even some recessive gene from a great grandparent, but rather from a distant ancestor or some outside stimuli as of yet undetected. But we are kindred spirits, and we call ourselves astropaths. I'll never forget how I learned who or what I really was. As Marlow, my teacher in this new existence, is fond of saying, when an astropath finds themselves, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. Of course, this allusion to Dickens' tale of two cities was not accidental. I mean, Marlowe, or should I say Dr. Pagonius, is a history professor after all, and his paper on revolution as an indicator of evolution is academic legend. Or at least, that's what the thoughts of the scholars I read at his university affirmed when I visited for a coffee. I'm rambling. Off topic. I made a promise to put it all down, to record this chaotic life of mine, and I need to stop making promises I don't intend to keep. I'm an astropath. I can astral project out of my body to anywhere I can see in my mind. I meditate, visualize, leave my body and appear in that location. Supposedly, so can some Buddhist monks but they travel with their spirit, and I am physically there. I leave behind a body that sleeps so completely, if anyone were to see it, they would think it is a corpse, completely comatose. As an astropath, I can also read the thoughts of people. It's a skill that takes some time, not to hear their thoughts, they flood in naturally, but to sort out their inconsistencies and understand the essence of their thoughts. Their bizarre conflict of conscious and unconscious thought. And I can, with other astropaths, communicate telepathically from great distance. These are our powers. We share a human anatomy, but our minds are quite different. We can't allow a CT scan of our brain. That would puzzle any neuroscientist, I can tell you that. And as all creatures or marginalized people on the Earth today know, one thing you don't want others to figure out is that you're special, different, other than. No one is in more danger than when they are singular in thinking, appearance, or faith. Cassandra, my sister, arrived at my dump of an apartment early that evening. I'd always loved her dearly. She was my sister, playmate, guardian, mother, hero. All through our childhood. She was a couple years older than me, and neighbor kids gravitated towards her, a leadership quality I never had. She organized games, designed our snow castle, planned our summer water balloon attacks on the kids from other streets, and no matter who was following her, her eyes always found mine. As if to say, let's do this, brother. Our parents missed out on the childhood we were living, for the most part. 
They were living a childhood of their own, one of late night house parties and midday brunches that led them to drunken, sleepy afternoons, a suburban childhood that might be familiar to many. I don't know, but it was the one we got, and it was a childhood that ended when I was 12 and she was 14. Our less than model parents attended a party where the cocaine was flowing freely all night and well into the morning light. Light which allowed the drug dealers who'd been ripped off and unwittingly supported this gathering to see through the curtains and be certain the thief was among the guests. They hit the house with what the press described as a barrage of military caliber assault weapons which shredded the paper-thin plaster walls. They sent their message with lead. It's not the theft or the money. It's the audacity that someone would steal from us, that they were determined to express and express it. They did. Our parents were among the dead, but our Uncle Tommy, who was probably involved in the theft, survived with a bullet lodged in his leg. So he received a bullet, a disability check monthly for the rest of his life, and two orphans, all in the same day. But Tommy was, despite being the biggest loser I've ever met, weepy about what happened to our parents. And despite being useless at parenting, he knew enough to let Cassandra and I make decisions, and even made sure there was no way he could get his hands on the insurance money that we would get on our 18th birthdays. He signed the things we needed for school, gave us a room to share in his tiny two-bedroom house, and stayed out of our way. Cassandra used her money to attend Denver University pre-medical. I used mine as a stake to start a business of my own, sort of a short-term investment opportunity. I'm off track again. So here it is. On that day, Cassandra arrived at my dump of an apartment early. Her incessant earliness was one of the two traits of hers that drove me crazy. The other being her insistence on calling me by my childhood name, Mikey. Despite my firm stance with everyone that they should call me Michael, Mikey, she called up to my second floor window, too lazy to walk up the stairs to the front door. Mikey, come on, let's go, she called. I was hungry, and I'd showered early, knowing she'd be, at best, on time. So I went on down. You look tired. Cards again last night, Cassandra asked me. Hey, I needed to pay the rent. Take my sister to dinner. And, she asked. I got another month of four walls and reservations for us at Morton's. Of course, since we're so early, you're buying us drinks in the bar while we wait for our seats. She smiled and answered, done. I missed you, Mikey. Feels like you're always busy. We always have to make time for each other, okay? Okay? She said with big sister seriousness. We are all we've ever had in this world, and we're all we'll ever need, I finished for her. So the night began wonderfully. It had been a few weeks since I'd seen her, and I was always a bit manic when she wasn't around. She calmed me and coaxed stories of card games and fast dates. Uh, Fast dates was what she called my first and last dates. She just pushed it together. She told me about exams, textbooks, coffee shops, cram sessions that led to coffee-fueled morning classes. She loved medicine, loved the feeling somehow it was all for the good, all for the benefit of the world, and all for the chance of some little girl, herself in a reflection of broken glass ten years ago, watching terrified as her parents faced life-threatening wounds, only to have the outcome reversed. To get the outcome every child deserves, their parents to survive. She'd always been my hero. Cynic as I was about everyone else and nearly everything else in the universe, 
my big sister was a benevolent miracle worker. Maybe that's where I stop for now. Yeah, that's where I stop.